Do you want to play a game? What's your favorite scary movie? Be afraid. Be very afraid. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Here's Johnny. The power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Hi, I'm Jamie. And I'm Nikisha, and this is Talking Horror with Jamie. And Nikisha. Where we share our love for spooky things and talk horror through the lens of human behavior. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And today, we are continuing on our March Madness journey. (laughs) With the 1990 American psychological horror film, Jacob's Ladder. Get out of bed. I can't, I'm freezing. Jack, for Pete's sake, get out of bed. What did the doctor say? Hey, you die on the way to the hospital now. Come on. Come on. Up. Up. Hold on, hold on. It'll be okay, Jake. Yay! Wee, 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 ladder sounds. <laughs> I'll, Whatever that might be. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> That's Someone okay. Yeah. Stepping on a Jacob's ladder uh, machine. Yeah, I'll just, see. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Fantabulous. <laughs> So Jacob's Ladder, it is directed by Adrian Lin and written by Bruce Joel Rubin. It stars Tim Robbins, Elizabeth Pena, Matt Craven, and Danny Aiello. And obviously, heavy, heavy spoilers. We are going to be talking about everything Jacob's Ladder. And no, we are not talking about the machine that you see in the gym, which I have tried and did not last for two minutes. So... If you have not Wait, watched that's Jacob the name Ladder, of a machine. It is the name of a machine at a gym in the last city that I was in in Pittsburgh. Our Airbnb had a gym and there was a machine called Jacob's Ladder and you strap on at the waist and you climb a ladder that's moving. And it is, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> to say the least, very stressful. And my heart rate jumped at an... Uh, an exorbitant amount <laughs> in two minutes. So that's nuts. <laughs> it's if you see one run, that's all I have to say. <laughs> so obviously uh, heavy spoilers. If you have not seen Jacob's ladder, then please pause, watch it. Or if you just want to listen to us, talk about it because there's some good stuff in there that I'm sure we will bring up about a lot of mental illnesses in particular, which is what we do here. So mm-hmm. any trigger warnings, Jamie, in this movie? Um, there's a lot of, uh, very vivid, uh, imagery that is unpleasant. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of war scenes that we see. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some tentacles and other like disturbing, uh, (laughs) well, maybe there's only one tentacle. I can't remember if there's other tentacles. (laughs) No, I think there are two tentacles. It's, if it's you don't lot. like tentacles, this is not for you. I guess um, one tentacle is enough to warrant a tentacle warning. That's a good one. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah here's yeah, exactly. your tentacle warning. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, what else is there in this? Just a lot of disturbing imagery. Um, a lot a of lot. like uh, some violent imagery, again, with the with the war scenes, um, unpleasant hospital imagery, uh, uh, loss <laughs> of a, like I guess loss of a child could be triggering. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And yeah, intense bathtub you. scenes. Mm-hmm, intense, mm-hmm. never. You know, there is a study out there that says something about taking cold showers and it doing something to you mentally jamie can you and i'm referring if you've seen the movie then you know what i'm talking about there is a scene with a tub and lots of ice and someone being submerged into the tub ice but jamie is that true (laughs) have you heard that taking cold showers and it doing something mentally good for you 
Um, I mean, I have seen a lot of TikToks that talk about holding ice packs up to your chest as a way to deal with anxiety. Ah, never heard that. And I have mm-hmm. many ice packs. Thanks, Hamilton, for the knees. <laughs> Something <laughs> yeah. to try. Okay. Well, I think we should just get right into it. Unless is there something new that you guys have watched? What's new in life? Have you seen any new trailers? What's going on? Um, we 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 always just watch horror trailers. Uh, I can't remember some of the ones we watch, but there's a lot of cool stuff coming out. So I'm super excited to watch a lot of that stuff. There's also so much in my queue on every single platform I have. Like, I don't even so know many. where to begin with some of these things. Like, luckily, mm-hmm. we all have a schedule so that like I have to watch like this specific thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know I just binged Cobra Kai. It's not horror. but <laughs> um, Nice. Well, I will say I watched The Exorcist. I don't know if I talked about this on the last one. Maybe I did. But I recently watched uh, The Exorcist and realized that I never watched it all the way through. I just saw, you know, all of the big pieces of it. And, you know, when we used to have cable, because that's not a life we have anymore. What's that? (laughs) Exactly. But AMC loved that station during Halloween because they would – constantly just play they would have a horror fest so all of october they would just be playing all of these different horror movies new ones old ones and so the exorcist and the Hmm. omen would always be kind of in the mix and so i feel i I felt like i saw the exorcist because i would if it was on i would just leave the tv on that and just watch it wherever it was at the moment the same with the omen uh but i sat and watched it all the way through. I also didn't realize some of the scenes because of course it was TV. So a lot of stuff was cut or edited Oh yeah, because sure. it's on TV and there is a lot of disturbing things in that movie that I definitely missed because it was cut out <laughs> so it could be put on TV. I imagine great. you being like, wait, there's an exorcism in this movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They want to make the G, the the PG version of The Exorcist on AMC. So there was a lot of stuff that you miss, you know. Yeah, but for sure. Still, still nice with the head turning and the throwing up peas everywhere. It was a good time. <laughs> mm, delicious, delicious peas. Speaking of peas, plot summary. Anyone? Oh. Two minute plot summary. We got to get it done, and I did it last I'll, time. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantabulous. If someone times me, I'll do the plot summary. What's the plot? <laughs> I got you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, random male noise, aka Brian, you have two minutes to okay. give us your best plot summary of Jacob's Lather. Really emphasize the beginning minute. Uh, of the actual film as long as you can and then really rush through the end yeah, uh, for the our, last 30 seconds. That's the talking Perfect. horror MO. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> that's the way, the talking horror way. <laughs> All right, ready? Yeah, uh-huh. Steady, go. Jacob's Ladder is a story of a man named Jacob who fought in Vietnam um, and something weird happens to his group of soldiers um, and he is uh, stabbed and we see him kind of laying there. Um, We flash to his life after this moment uh, where he is um, separated or divorced from his wife. We found out that he had lost a child, a.k.a. a a surprise appearance by Macaulay Culkin, a very young one. Um, But something's wrong with him. He works for the post office, but like he's having hallucinations he doesn't know what's happening he's like getting he's getting sick uh he he goes to this party he gets lost in the subway things are happening to him and he's very confused as to what's happening and then we also um he like slips through time like he's having hallucinations that bring him back to before the war when he and his wife were together and they seem to be connected somehow because like he's cold and he's cold previous to that and lots of crazy things are happening to this this guy and then we go back to the uh, war and we see a little bit more about what happened to him there. And then at the end, he starts to um, – he, he reunites with a lot of his buddies from the war who go to uh, George Costanza, uh, a lawyer, to try and um, – you know, figure out what happened to them. They think they were poisoned. They think the U.S. Army was doing tests on them. They think they weren't actually attacked by the Viet Cong. They actually think that they were attacked by their own people to test things. Long story short, they find out that that's potentially true. Um, and we find out that he's actually dying on the table the whole time. And he dies. And this was all just happening in his head because he died in Vietnam. 
Uh, the end. And that's the plot. Yes. Wow. Uh, there was on. no ladder in this movie. I forgot to mention that. This is a ladderless film. Oh, yeah, film. you're right. This is a ladderless <laughs> film. It's Ray the, the NL for no ladder. Oh, well, yes. My, my question to you both is, what's your favorite kind of ladder? Um, do you like the like oh fire truck God. ladders that like you know that you have to like that like spread extend. apart that extend, or do you like the A frame ones that you just kind of use in the house, or are you more of a step stool Ooh. gal? Mm. Oh, I mm. like the A frame mm. only because of WWF wrestling, and they did the tables, ladders, and chairs <laughs> yes. matches, and that's the kind of ladders that they use. Mm, mm. <laughs> that's gonna be my just, answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I'm more of a step stool kind of gal uh, Mm -hmm. because I am not very tall and I am afraid of heights. So the closer to the ground I can be, the better off we all are. Nice. I didn't know you were afraid Mm -hmm. of heights. (coughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a lot of fears. (laughs) Well, Nikisha, did you know Mm -hmm. that Jamie and I watched The Amazing Race and we Mm -hmm. love it? And we've mm-hmm. just de- and like we've decided we learned a lot about each other while watching thirty three seasons of the Amazing Race, <laughs> yeah. and I learned that she really doesn't like heights, so I would have to do all the height challenges and yeah. um, mm-hmm. like the skydiving, the bungee jumping. And don't get me wrong, I'm not a hu- I'm not like Mister Heights, um, I'm not in the heights. Mister in the heights. <laughs> yeah, but I would do it. I would do it for her and for a million dollars. Yeah. Yes, that million dollars that changes I know. everything. Uh, but it doesn't change my fear of heights. I'm so very afraid. I mean, it's understandable, but Brian, work that's why it. Brian's got you. Random male noise mm-hmm. got you. And we, mm-hmm. and we can make that's it true. Through. That's true. <laughs> Fantabulous. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get into it. Uh, I want to know your relationship with this movie. Have you seen it before? And then we can get into the good old likes and gripes of it all. Woo-hoo. And now our likes and gripes. Woo, woo, woo. So, Jamie, why don't you go first? What's your relation with this with relationship with this movie? So, I have actually never seen this movie before, um, mm-hmm. but I I know that it had a cult following. Uh, like, you know, back when I was learning more about horror movies to get over my fear of horror movies, did a lot of research and uh, went down a lot of Wikipedia rabbit holes. And it's been on my list for a really long time. I just never really got around to it. Um, mm-hmm. And I was really surprised and excited to hear that there was an influence for the Silent Hill video games Mm. as an avid gamer, Um, but not an avid horror video game gamer because they're spooky. They're scary. I can't handle it. Um, Very (laughs) different from watching the scary movies. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but yeah, so, so I, I kind of like had been anticipating this for a while Watching it was really interesting. I, I didn't really know what to expect because um, I kind of steered clear of knowing what it was really about other than like psychological horror. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it really delivers in psychological horror. It's it's There's like a lot of stuff going on. It took me a few days to really like digest this movie um, after a first watch. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of like talk through other people's thoughts. Yeah, I will say the same, Jamie, in the fact that this is my first time watching this movie. I have heard of it before, and of course, as always, in my Watch Mojo top tens, it was somewhere mm. in there on the mm, list. And so sure. I saw little clips of it, but I never really knew the full concept of what was going on. And so sitting and watching it, I watched it today and I feel like I need a couple of days to actually process it because I don't really know how I feel about it. A lot of mixed feelings as far as likes and gripes of it all. I really enjoyed the scoring of everything. I thought it kind of added to the intensity of everything, but I'm also not a big war movie person. So Mm -hmm. anything involving that or of the like is not a peak interest. So it was hard for me to kind of zero in on what was happening. But uh, as Brian has mentioned before with other movies for this podcast, it is very interesting because of everything that it deals with and how we even treat veterans when they are out into the world again after everything that they have experienced and gone through. And I think my biggest gripe was 
the twist at the end and that he hmm. um, sure. <clears throat> died on the table at spoiler. Vietnam. <laughs> spoiler. Obviously, he said spoilers. <laughs> uh, but I think I would have been more pleased if he was having all of these dreams and fantasies, hallucinations, whatever you want to call them, when he was on that ice bath. I wanted to believe that he got out and that he was truly experiencing PTSD because it seems a little weird, and we'll get into this, but to have that kind of quote-unquote PTSD or hallucinations or, you know, facing your life when you're on your deathbed and it's things that are kind of in the future Mm. and... I don't know, it was just an interesting concept because that's not usually how it is. You're either, you know, going from the past. It's not a matter of things that have never even happened. He never even had that girlfriend, whatever her name was, uh, Jezebel. But he made up a whole entire life with her and a new apartment and a new job and all of these things. And it just seems really uh, awkward that that was the case. So I think I probably would have liked it better if the hallucinations and dreams started happening at the ice bed fever dream sequence. Mm. But that's just my opinion. Brian, what about you? Uh, I agree with both of you. I did. I, I, I enjoyed watching the movie and then I didn't enjoy the ending because I think it undercut everything we just watched. Yeah. And, and then uh, I've been thinking about it for the past couple of days and I, I, the more distance I get from it, from it, the more I enjoyed it, the more, um, you know, it's less about the whole movie for me. I, may, I We'll talk through that. Maybe it's not. But I just really remember moments from it, whether it's the like, you know, the crazy like moving heads that we'll probably talk about in the special effects, whether it's just Tim Robbins performance, which is really good. And the bathtub sequence, like I, for some reason, like the idea of the neighbors in New York, like helping you and putting Liberty in the ice to you is like yeah. fascinating to me. Um, I, I and there were moments um I like how it all connected in some ways and but I also felt like I've seen this movie before. I've seen mm. movies where like we're like we're at a moment where like their lives are flashing before their eyes or they're creating a different yeah. future for themselves in a a moment of peril or death or something like that. And while this may be one of the first to kind of do it, I mean the the occurrence at Owl Creek does it before this in some ways, if you, if you know that one. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't impressed by the twist. I was more impressed by the movie than the twist, if that makes sense. And I, and, and, and I, I'd love to break that down a little bit more. Cause like, is this a PTSD movie? If you never actually had PTSD, even exactly. though they're, mm-hmm. even though they're, they're trying to portray it because, we, because, because the post-war stuff while not real is still his reality and our reality as an audience mm-hmm. member watching it. So I'm fascinated to think what we also think about that. Um, so I, those are my likes and gripes. Yeah. And let's just get into the, the PTSD of it all, because I was also thinking the same thing, Brian, <laughs> Nikisha, what is this movie trying what are to we, say? What are we calling this seg- segment? Mmm, brains. <laughs> Brains. <laughs> we're, tr- we're trying this out. This is new. The, so our our our, our mm, brains segment is just where we talk the mental health and human behavior stuff. So get ready, listeners. Mm, brains. <laughs> we're getting all up in that brain about PTSD. <laughs> oh, we're getting all up in that brain. I love it. <laughs> so yeah, Jamie, if you can just give us the most general layman's term definition of PTSD and then we can kind of get into how it is or is not represented in this particular movie. Yeah. So PTSD is an acronym, man. If there are any other mental health professionals listening out there, you know (laughs) how how many acronyms exist within this field. We love we love acronyms, even though then you have to go back and explain everything. I don't know. It's a big, it's, it's yes. too much. <laughs> PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. And it occurs when people have experienced or witnessed some kind of traumatic event. Um, typically what, you know, they, they might call it a big T 
trauma. So like a natural disaster, um, like a, a, a serious accident, war, um, sexual assault, rape, uh, domestic violence, uh, you know, um, like near death experience, serious injuries, things like that. And that's not to say that, you know, there are other things that don't necessarily meet those criteria that can't also cause trauma, which is why sometimes people like designate things as big T traumas versus little T traumas. And I will also say that this is to like meet the official criteria for a psychiatric diagnosis. Um, but you know, people experience all kinds of different traumas. Um, right. and then what PTSD looks like, um, is, uh, increased like arousal or reactivity to things. So like you're on high alert, you're, you're on edge, you're hypervigilant to stuff that's around you. Um, you might be having what are, what I guess you could call like intrusive type, um, thoughts, whether that's flashbacks. So you're like reliving that traumatic event multiple Mm -hmm. times or nightmares. Sometimes people have nightmares. That's essentially the same thing of reliving the event in their dreams. Um, Sorry, but before you continue, just even with that. So you said that you can have high sensitivity to things around you and you're, and you're on high alert Mm -hmm. Is that anything, not just things that might have to do with your particular trauma that you experienced? Correct. You're like, it's just like hypervigilance generally. Like, yeah, like super, like being easily startled by anything, uh, you know, just like kind of constantly looking over your shoulder. You might have difficulty like focusing on things because like you're constantly just like always trying to be aware of anything that might happen. Mm -hmm. Um, Irritability also comes with that too. Um, so that's two things. So I said the the reactivity and the intrusive thoughts like flashbacks and nightmares. Um, the third major characteristic is um, avoidance. So like people typically don't want to revisit the traumatic things that have happened to them. Um, as I'm sure most people can probably agree with, we don't like negative, bad things. We don't want to think about them. We don't want to revisit them. We will do whatever we can to constantly seek out joy and pleasure and never experience bad things ever again. So if you've experienced like the worst trauma of your life, you will do whatever you can to not have to think about it, relive it in any way. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that might be like not talking about it. That could be, um, you know, using substances to like completely disconnect from it. Um, Avoidance can look like a whole bunch of things. Also like not remembering it well, because again, like trauma does weird things to your brain. Um, So you might, so it it might make it really hard to actually recall the events. Um, And then uh, like changes in your mood. So, you know, you're, you're feeling lower, you're feeling more anxious. You might've lost interest in things that you used to like to do. Um, You might be avoiding other people, isolating yourself, um, just feeling very, very low. So that's like kind of what PTSD can look like and how PTSD is, is triggered. And you don't have to have all of these things. You can just have one or some of them and you could be officially diagnosed. You, you have to meet all of these criteria to like actually have a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, so I'm just like talking about all of the things. Okay. Can we, Mm-hmm. Can I ask just what about like, can we talk a little bit more about hallucinations? Um, yeah. Because I feel, oh, cool. Um, because I, <laughs> I feel like, a, um, I feel like in movies and this one too. And again, this one is a little on the fence of how it deals with PTSD. Cause is it, um, mm-hmm. uh, but, um, like are hallucinations like a huge part of it? Is that totally separate? I feel like movies portray a lot of that. Obviously, it's a visual medium, so like hallucinations do help the storytelling. But I'm just sure. curious, like you, because you mentioned flashbacks. Is that this? Is that's not the same thing as a hallucination per se? I guess because in this, Correct. he thinks he. We think he's hallucinating in this. He sees the tentacles and stuff like that. But really, mm-hmm. it's kind of like hell or heaven or whatever it is breaking through to take him. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like he can't go up the stairs, maybe because like he can't go up into heaven until he like like figures out his thing or whatnot. He can't go, he can't, he can't go through the tunnel because the train's coming towards him because he has to deal with whatever he needs to deal with. Like, like Mm -hmm. 
he he's thinks, like got unfinished business. Yeah, like yeah, and maybe I'm going too far down that path, but like just hallucination hallucinations wise, can we talk a little bit about that as it relates to PTSD or if it does at all? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's not a, a super common. Um, symptom of PTSD. And I agree with you that like, I think you're going to see in visual mediums that like hallucinations are just like, what I see is one of the most common ways that, that movies and TV are portraying mental illness, Mm -hmm. even if that's not necessarily like reality as a way to like highlight that somebody is mentally ill in, in, in TVs and movies. So at least that's like what I've found to be true. But the reality is that like you know, there, it's not to say that like people, I mean, I don't think that people fit perfectly into these boxes. Again, as I mentioned, like the criteria for PTSD is like particularly strict, but I do think that a lot of people have experienced trauma and might not necessarily fall under the official diagnostic description of PTSD, but might still have elements of, of what this looks like. So I don't think that people fit neatly into boxes. I think that like there, I mean, there certainly are people who have experienced trauma and also have, have experienced hallucinations. Um, I don't think that's a very common symptom of trauma. Um, and maybe there's like something else. Diagnosing is also like, I feel like a very delicate practice because like you kind of have to figure out are, is this a symptom of this thing or is this its own separate thing that's also coexisting right. at the same time? Is this because, is this like caused by this other thing? And it's really hard to know a lot of these things unless you've been working with someone for a really long time, which is also frustrating when you have to like diagnose for insurance companies and like, sure. you know, yeah. give a diagnosis on the first session. It's like, who knows? But yeah, so long story short, um, hallucinations are, are not a super common, uh, symptom that goes along with PTSD, but it's not like, it's not, you know, not heard of. Right. And so if we are to forget the twist in this particular movie, and we're just going through this as if he is experiencing all of these things, do you think that, this movie gives all of the symptoms that you have described for us to say, yes, he has PTSD. I mean, I definitely think he's hypervigilant. He is, I mean, is he, ha- I mean, I guess he does have one flashback or we, he's a couple flashbacks. I was thinking about the flashback that he has of his son, Macaulay Culkin, um, when he gets hit by the car. And then uh, it's hard to know what is, a flashback again because of the twist, but like he, there's so much, uh, there's so many like interjections of the, of the war that's happening. And like, mm-hmm. I guess we're to assume that those are flashbacks, but I think in reality it's like happening in real time. I don't really know. It's, I don't really oh, know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we could say that those are potentially flashbacks to, you know, his time in the war. Um, And I mean, I, uh, I guess, I mean, he's definitely like anxious. Uh, There are moments, I mean, his, I definitely want to talk about his relationship with Jezebel because it's kind of all over the place in my opinion. And so in thinking about like how he connects with other people, um, I mean, I, I, it's not, it's also not surprising to me that like, as a result of his son dying, that that, inter- that, that like led to the divorce with, with his ex-wife. And I right. think that that's like, you know, uh, uh, not like the most common thing. I I haven't studied couples who have unfortunately like lost children. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I think that that kind of loss really heavily impacts a relationship and, and like, it's, it's definitely, you know, it, it makes sense that their relationship ends because of that kind of loss. And yeah. it's interesting to then have this flashback of like in that bathtub scene, when there's that scene, whether it's a flashback or like this alternate reality of him being with his entire family again, including his son who passed away and like what that experience is like, um, to see like, you know, this, 
trajectory of like what could have happened if things continued and like that that really did have such an impact on the family dynamic that that then led to like this relationship ending but the fact that he's not like it to- he's not totally isolated like he does have another relationship um he he like you know tries to reach out and connect with um with the other people in his uh in, in his, his division yeah. yeah um so like i think there are some things that he's doing he's able to maintain his job right. um which i think is also like a, a you know something positive um so like there's things here and there that i think point to ptsd but there's other things that like i think it's confusing because of like how this narrative goes but um other signs that like you know he's not totally alone he has some form of a support system um right. and like is trying to you know he's trying to get answers he's trying to work through it he's like kind of leaning into that in a way he's not necessarily avoiding it because he just wants to know what's going on exactly and with the PTSD, they mention in the movie something called a veterans outpatient program. Mm-hmm. Is that a thing or is there something of the like that happens for any war veterans right after they come back home? Is there Are they required to do immediate psychological uh, help or, you know, whatever the case to help them out before they go home? Or is that optional? What do you know about that? <laughs> Yeah. So, so there is in the United States, we have the Department of Veterans Affairs, also known as the VA. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, basically like the support that, um, that the government offers veterans. Um, and there's all kinds of services that they offer, but they do offer mental health services. So that is something that, um, folks do have access to if they're veterans, um, outpatient implies that it's, uh, I mean, that I am to assume that like, because it's outpatient that like people are going of their own free will, but okay. I, I, you know, who knows what the, what the case may be for, um, for, I've never worked in the VA. I, I don't have like a ton of experience of like working with veterans. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I mean, there's like a lot of that, like there's a pretty significant budget that I think goes to the VA. And so like, there's a lot of resources that they have at their disposal to offer to veterans, um, which I, I want to be hopeful that, that then that means that there's good services that people are using. Um, right. Yeah. But, but I, I don't know. So I'm assuming that he like, you know, goes like by his own volition, he's choosing to go, even though then they have no record of him, which is like, you know, another okay. thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so, uh, outpatient. So like he's going on his own, he's not like mandated to seemingly. Um, and it's, it's probably like, you know, like a once a week, once a month, like check-in kind of thing, right. um, Absolutely. to meet with his psychiatrist. Uh, that's what, at least what it seemed like. Um, but that also makes me wonder if they have like inpatient services and, and other things like that, um, which I don't actually know. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so interesting watching this movie. It also made me just think about because this movie is, it's, well, he went, he was in the Vietnam War, so it's in the 60s. And you talking about the services, I'm wondering what those services were like back then as opposed to now. Do you know mm. when the uh, VA started? Does it, does it say? Let's ask Wikipedia. <laughs> yes. Cause I don't actually know. Um yeah. so many in- pieces of information about war. Okay. It was yes. for- oh, it was formed in 1989. So oh, not wow. that long ago. That that's upsetting. That's it's <laughs> that as seems, old as we are. <laughs> that seems well, I guess like there's always been veterans benefits. Since the American right. Revolutionary War, but okay. the veteran-specific federal agency was not established until 1930 as the Veterans Administration, and then it had extended, and then it officially became like a, the Department of um, Veterans Affairs mm-hmm. uh, in 1989. Wow. 
Yeah, it's just with the whole, you know, drafting and things and the climate that we're in now with everything happening in Ukraine and Russia, it just also made me think about what is that life like now for people or if America has to get involved in all of all of the things that we don't want to think about but are in the atmosphere and in the air. Uh, so just watching this, it also made me think, because I don't even know what about, and maybe this is just me being asleep in history class because I hated history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but not even knowing, you know, about drafting and getting into the army and it being voluntary. If it's not, what is the deal? You know, all that stuff. But mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, Wait, do you want to know how much their budget was in 2019? Yes. Their annual budget was $200 billion. <sighs> so like they're, they, they better be using those resources, right? Uh, absolutely. Also, <laughs> they yes, all the resources. Also, <laughs> everyone should be giving them everything because what you fought for our country, please help people mm-hmm. out. There's there's no reason why there should be homeless veterans out in the street, but that's another conversation for another day. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, so <laughs> with Jacob, he's running through the psych ward and you mentioned he, he was going to meet with his psychiatrist and it's probably like a once or a week once a week type situation but it was just interesting in the movie him running through this kind of mental institution and is that that was where he was having these sessions he knew where the doctor's office was but he's running through this institution of of people who are being you know held here and (sighs) Do, do people, you know, use psychiatrists in a psych ward of that nature? How did you feel about that whole depiction? Because that just seemed really confusing to me that you're, they're holding these group sessions, you know, and, but it's in the midst of this kind of prison type environment. All right. If I well, may, can you expand upon that? if yes. I may, I watched the movie with her and yes. boy, oh boy, did she react to those scenes. Like whenever we like <laughs> that or like Candyman or like a lot of these scenes in those type of movies, Jamie always just like is up in arms about. So I'm going to, I just like, I can't like, why? Like, yeah. can we just stop? Like, I, I understand that like, you know, the history of mental institutions is like a very like horrifying history. And I'm not Mm -hmm. saying that, you know, that, that, that didn't happen, but like, okay. Are you talking about the part where he's like being wheeled after being beaten up in the car and he, (laughs) they're like wheeling him through these offices and he's like, they're running over like limbs and stuff with the cart. And I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? Like, this is why, (laughs) <laughs> it's it's shit like this which like makes people not want to talk to therapists and like exactly. talk to mental health providers because they think they're going to be sent to a a place and be like tied up and put on a gurney and rolling mm. over people in cages who are like climbing on the top and yeah. like then rattling and so much rattling. There's no rattling in hosp- in any hospital I've ever been to. Um, <laughs> I have not seen a single rattler or heard a rattle. Yeah. Um, I don't understand. Well, even earlier on in the movie when he's trying to find, I, I believe his name was Dr. Carlson. Oh, like something. searching for the doctor when they're like, we have no record of you. Yes, but he's running through people and the police officers running after him, but the people in the mental, mental institution kind of start grabbing on the police officer and holding him back so that Jacob can get through. <laughs> so yeah. like, what? You're running through this place trying to find your psychiatrist. It would it your psychiatrist be in that kind of place? That's what the question was for me. What what is that place? That is Yeah. Matter. I mean, it's also like there aren't I, I mean from my memory of like working in behavioral health settings, like there aren't police officers who are like walking the corridors. It's, they do have people who are in the, who like are on those units who are there to like restrain people if necessary. Um, so like, I also probably would have assumed that they probably would have restrained him. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean like there, you know, there are times where people are just kind of like walking around, but I don't think that, (laughs) I don't think that all of the people on the unit would then be like restraining the people who's, who work there, who are 
supposed to be restraining them. Right. So yeah, that was exactly. that was weird. Also, I, will, um, <laughs> I will say, movies like this, I give a slight pass at scenes like that because he's creating this reality versus it's actually like a reality. However, mm. that does not give it a pass in a lot of other movies we've seen and usually how this thing is portrayed. Um, but I would give it a slight pass in this one because it's, it's made up. From his yeah. Own it's just, it's, it's interesting because even thinking back at haunted houses and what are the things that are scary and it's mm -hmm. running through a psych ward or a mental institution and there's mm -hmm. bodies and there's nurses with big needles and ready to, like Jamie said, tie you down and all of these things. And it's just, it's just interesting because you're right, Jamie, it's something that has happened and we recognize that that has happened, but that doesn't mean that that's the reality of it now. And that gives a stigma that anyone who has any type of mental illness will immediately be going to a place of that nature that doesn't exist. That's mm -hmm. not what it is now in, in 2022. And I'm sure in the 1990s when this movie was made, that wasn't a thing either, but it's just, it's interesting to see that that's where horror movie people revert to because that's where the scare is at. But mm -hmm. like you said, Brian, it's, it is something that was created in, in his head and it is the scare of the movie, of the horror movie, but you can still find a, a better way without kind of putting a stereotype on mental illness for sure, especially for yeah. people who don't have much information about it and think that that's what the reality is. Yeah. Mm, brains. Yes. <laughs> brains. They, I thought they probably rolled up some brains in that scene when he was going through the gurney. But <laughs> Oh, my God. Yeah. It's, Just nuts. It's, it's completely nuts. So in this movie, it talks one of the uh, – his chiropractor, who is apparently the angel <laughs> figure in this, that in a crazy scene breaks him out of the doctors and brings him <laughs> to the chiropractor. And you don't need a doctor. You just need a chiropractor. But we know it's <laughs> the angel vibe. He was taking them out of hell-ish place to be more in a heavenish ish place. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But he talks a lot about fears or he talks about how if you're running away, the demons are the ones that are kind of pulling you away. But if you kind of give into it, the angels are the ones that are freeing you from this earth. And I don't think we really talked about the fear of death per se in this podcast. I mean, there's a lot of death in the movies that we've watched. But is there a name for someone who has a really detrimental fear or a debilitating fear of death? Yeah. So I also looked this up because man, there is a phobia for everything. Wow. Um, and I, I definitely do not know, uh, many of them. Um, but an intense fear of death or dying is also known as thanatophobia. Thanatophobia? Like fa yeah. like Thanos. Oh, Thanos. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sounds like Phantom. Like. I'm afraid of being <laughs> snapped away. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Thanosphobia. <laughs> Thanos. <laughs> Thanotophobia is an intense fear of death or dying. I'm going to stick with Thanos because that's now that's <laughs> going to be because that's basically what it was. I mean, he snapped him. Where did they go? And then they came back. Anyway, mm -hmm. different podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another random question, just because this is curiosity for me, but the name shrink is used in this. I think one of the, uh, what is it? The Seinfeld character guy. I forgot his name. Also, Merrily, we roll along. Yes. What is his name? Jason Alexander. Jason Alexander. We went to the same ever. high school. No way. At, at the same time? Wow. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I think he's the one who says, you need to just go find a shrink. Where does mm. the nickname shrink even come from? So I also looked this up because I did not know. Um, and it doesn't totally explain where the connection is, but mm. it comes from the concept of head shrinkage. And head shrinkage mm. refers to a practice in ancient times that involved shrinking the head of a conquered enemy. And so it started to be used as slang for psychiatrists. <laughs> That's oh, <laughs> that's a stretch <laughs> of a connection. But, yeah. Okay. Wow. I don't. I don't I get mean, it. 
I all I know Shaving is that heads. uh there's one in Beetlejuice. There exactly. is. Exactly. Mm-hmm. The shrinking of heads. But and I want other a tiki than that, bar in our house one day. I guess people people compared the experience of meeting with a psychiatrist to feeling like their heads were metaphorically being shrunken. And so okay. that's where that came from. Sure. Well, here's a question because you were just talking explaining PTSD before. But mm-hmm. is there any way that you can have maybe, I don't know if, I don't think MRI is the right procedure, but something where they can look into your brain and see what is stimulating it and what causes different things in different parts of your brain to kind of determine different illnesses or, or diagnosis. Is there a procedure to do that? Like to see if you have a diagnosis based on like things happening in your brain? Yeah. Just like things firing off in your brain. I don't know. There's what's called a hypo, um, I was the front part of your brain. I don't know. I'm The frontal cortex. But there's something that <laughs> starts with an H. Hippocampus? I, yes. Those are all the brain parts? Yes. A hippocampus, the amygdala. The amygdala, the, yes. The, heard <laughs> oh my God. I This is me. My freshman year, first semester, I took a brain and behavior lab uh-huh. and we learned about all of the brain parts. We actually, our final exam was walking into the lab and there were literally brains on all of the lab tables Please. with very tiny they were very tiny brains because they were like rat brains and stuff. And yeah. they had these very small pins in them. And we had to write down what part of the brain the, the pin, pin was, was sticking out of. Uh, Man, that was so – I think I got a C on it. It was so hard. There's so many different parts. And even just watching the little bit of things that I watch on YouTube or what I read in a magazine, it's just so – interesting to see those things. So that's just what had me thinking of, is there a way that you can kind of track that kind of activity in your brain and that leading to a specific diagnosis of any kind, just in general? Um, I mean, I don't think, uh, I feel like most of the time, well, I'll say two things. One is that like when you're, if something feels off and you're like going to see a psychiatrist or, or any kind of mental health professional, the rule of thumb is to always rule out like medical issues. So Mm. like in kind of talking through and like getting a history and background on what someone's experiencing, part of the process is like trying to see if there could be any other explanation for what might be going on, especially Mm. if there is some kind of medical explanation. Um, but if, if you feel like it's more like psychological then starting to kind of hone in and, and ask questions to kind of get more information on that. That being said, which is why I was like, I don't think that people typically will like go the route of like, you know, I want to scan my brain to figure out like what my psychological concerns and issues might be. Um, but I, I mean, I do think that you know, for a certain thing, I mean, there's like all, all kinds of research that has existed where like, you know, people have dissected brains or like mm-hmm. done all kinds of experiments to see what's going on based on, you know, the, the mental illnesses that we're familiar with today. Um, but I don't, I mean, I could be totally, totally wrong, but I don't think that people are typically like going to get like an MRI or a CAT scan yeah. for, for like, for, I would say most psychiatric, um, diagnoses, um, unless it's like something really difficult, like really impairing someone's functioning and also really difficult to kind of like suss out what might be going on maybe. Um, but then again, at that point, someone might think that it's more of a medical thing and like it warrants that type of follow up. But I would say like most mental health professionals are probably just doing like comprehensive assessments to figure out what's going on based on like, you know, the DSM, as we've mentioned many a time, but like that, that kind of helps guide the process. And so like the questions that we're asking are to help kind of delineate based on this diagnostic manual, what might be going on. But again, knowing that like not everybody perfectly fits into, you know, all of the criteria for something or like 
Yeah, exactly. And, and so like, I think more and more they've been expanding to say like, this kind of falls in this category, but like we can't get more specific. So they have like not otherwise specified categories to kind of like still be a little bit vague in general, even if they're like, it's like depression though, but like, we're not going to necessarily call it that. Right. And rule of thumb, if everything rolls out, rolls itself out, then it's probably demonic possession, like in The Exorcist. Oh, yeah, totally. Of course. <laughs> because that's exactly what happened totally. in that movie. The, the yeah. mother got every single doctor, psychiatrist, and even did hypnotherapy. And mm-hmm. they eventually found out she was the daughter was just possessed. So... Have you been spitting up peas lately? Like, I know you haven't been feeling well. I just want to oh, check in. Oh, we're not going to talk about the pea spillage that <laughs> has been uh, my life with <laughs> the flu. <laughs> but I, I will say it was it was not uh, as chilly as it probably was in that in that movie with all of the uh, <laughs> cold ice and everyone freezing and all the things. Mm. But yes, <laughs> so with this movie and it's really hard to even think of of these questions and ask because like Brian mentioned earlier, the ending kind of erases everything else in the movie, which is why it makes it so hard to kind of process. Mm -hmm. But I do want to ask a question again, eliminating what the ending was, but the movie also talks about not only, you know, letting yourself, kind of fall into the nature of death, but also kind of gaining closure with everything so that you can kind of get out of this purgatory and go with your finished business onward, you know, to wherever you go, whatever place you go to. But my question is, do you think that Jacob could have found some kind of closure without finding out the uh, experiments and the LSD drugs that were given to him in his unit. And how could he have gained that kind of closure without knowing exactly what was going on? So could he have, do you think he could have found closure without knowing all that stuff? And if so, how? Yeah, that's a really good question because the thing that stands out to me is like the thing when he dies, the last thing he does is like he goes with his son up the stairs and like there's something about that that felt more important than him finding out the truth mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but i could That's be true. i could be totally wrong and it could be that like it was confirming this truth that set him free so to speak um yeah. and 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 not like but the fact that he kind of like kept revisiting the experience with his son and like, I don't know. I just felt like that was really meaningful because that then connected with him actually like going up the stairs, no ladder, just stairs. Right. Just the stairs. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because it was him finding out the information was the catalyst for him to really kind of come to terms with everything. But he wasn't really done with his business until he went home and kind of reconciled everything that happened with his son. But if someone is going through some type of PSD and maybe like you said, they're, they don't have their full memory, so they don't know exactly what's going on. They just have kind of fragments of what has happened. How can they kind of have closure and move forward without knowing exactly everything that's happened to them. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know. I mean, I feel like in, I feel like in reality, like, you know, closure is always what we're seeking because again, like we don't like being left with things that are like not finished and unsaid. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think it's, I mean, my guess is more of just like kind of speaking on, on that part of like existing as a person that like we, we like things to like be resolved and like there to be answers. But I think in reality, like we don't always have answers. So right. it's, uh, it's interesting that like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, now I'm like going on like a, a tangent that doesn't even make any sense, but I'm just thinking about how like, Love you it. know, <laughs> is it tr- like how, how important was this in order to like move on? And like, that was like fundamentally mm. the thing that he needed to move on. But 
Yeah. But I don't know. That seems so disconnected to like the stuff with his son. But I think that's probably why we have questions about this movie because some of the things don't connect to make a straight line either. Mm. It's, it's what, like you said, what is important that is leading him to be able to find closure. It seems like he is having half hallucinations about the war and everything that's happened, but then half about just his family because he obviously still misses them. And we don't know exactly what happened with them, but in his hallucinations, they aren't together anymore, but he wants them to be back together. And he even has the chiropractor saying, oh, your wife still does love you. You should go back to her, you know, blah, 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 and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So yeah, just, it's, it's interesting that you mention because human behavior wise, why is it that we always have to have things that are finished and things that are done? Because I will say, uh, <laughs> as someone who procrastinates a lot and doesn't finish things a lot, I really don't have too much <laughs> of an issue with things are just kind of like, okay, you know, it didn't really happen <laughs> fully. I'm totally fine with it. Or he can kind of justify some things to move on, but it's just interesting you bringing up and I'm just speaking on just the human behavior aspect of wanting things to be complete and where yeah. does that even come from? Because in some instances, some people are okay with things just, you know, it not being a straight line and you can kind of float in the in-between of things. And some but people just want things black or white. That's really Maybe interesting right. because like horror movies in general, like a lot of the times – give you closure and then take it away like the original Halloween where he falls out the window, you see him lying there and then he's gone. So like, yeah, and it's mm-hmm. funny because like, like law and order episodes are a perfect example of that where like yes. in real life, 99.9% of those crimes would like not be like solved 100%. But like right. we love the closure of those procedurals. And then in horror mm-hmm. movies, we love the closure. However, and and we love the idea that like this um, – I guess I'm talking more about slasher movies. But sl- yeah. like like this is the bad guy. He is out to slash you. Um, you, you, you dispose of him at the end. But then because of, you know, capitalism, there's there's more story to tell. So it's not full closure. Um, so that's interesting. Like when you get movies like this where there isn't as much closure, like you're getting confused. And it's also really interesting because like it doesn't make sense in a way like – why would he be getting closure on something in the moments before he dies to allow himself to die on something he doesn't even know is happening in terms right. of mm-hmm. like the drugs? But I agree right. with Jamie that the closure of him just like coming to grips with the fact that like his son was gone um, and that his son is the one kind of bringing him towards the light. Um, I understand the concept that like him finding closure on the the like Agent Orange or the LSD or whatever they're using on the soldiers in this context, like him finding out that closure allows him his son to appear um, mm-hmm. and like take him. So I agree with Jamie in that it's like it's a little bit disjointed and convoluted, but like yeah. the storytelling of this movie is fascinating, and I think that's where it succeeds for me. But like. And I, and I like rules and I don't necessarily need it to be like completely understood, but I, I do like a right. little bit more of a neat bow when I'm watching a movie um, with like a quote twist, if that makes sense. Well, yeah. And something mm-hmm. just that doesn't have the twist undercut everything that has kind of happened because if this, what is, what is the purpose then of this movie? Because it's not PTSD. He's hasn't, recovered from the trauma he's in the trauma mm-hmm. yeah it's like actively trauma he's actively thing. in the trauma that big t. trying to get better so yeah that's a big t that's a big t so here's here's another question we've talked about this on the podcast before is this a reveal or is this a twist mm. I, as we talk about it, i think this is a reveal uh, to me, a twist is something that happens to the story as opposed to revealing something about the story you've already been watching. So I think this is a reveal as opposed to like a twist where like, oh, no, like your long lost sister showed up or something like that. To me, that's a twist like this. Hmm. Uh, what's another movie that has it? like like hereditary 
that's meant necessarily that's not necessarily a twist that's a reveal of what's been happening this whole time yeah or even uh like what was the movie about the sister who was dead the whole time that we just watched and did the podcast oh the uninvited the uninvited, the uninvited. <laughs> so is that would you consider that a reveal yes of what was happening the whole time yes okay. hmm I'm going to, I don't. I guess reveals can be narrative twists, if that makes sense. Like, a reveal can be a twist, but a twist isn't a reveal. Mm. Yeah. I just Googled the difference between a twist and a reveal because I'm curious what the internet has to say. One is a dance. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> what's the other uh uh, uh a reveal, a reveal. On it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a drag race term it's drag yeah race. one is a dance one is a drag race term <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> a reveal is simply a revelation a new piece of information that affects the direction of the narrative for the characters from that point on a twist by contrast is a realization that the past now has to be reconstructed in a different manner that what that what we've been witnessing hasn't necessarily been the truth. So it's the opposite of what I think? <laughs> uh, that's a twist, or is it a reveal? That's, or is it a reveal? Oh, oh that's so interesting. Because that that's, that's not how I interpret the words, but those right. definitions are fascinating. Yeah. Huh. Oh, no. So this is, in <laughs> fact... A twist? I guess. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. I don't like this one moment. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Okay. (sighs) Well, do we have any more thoughts on this? I think our minds have been more reveals by this twist reveal. Uh, (laughs) uh, The twist and reveal. I don't know. I I did find a lot of this movie upsetting in a good way, the way it's supposed to make you feel. Um, in mm. like the the bathtub sequence when he's screaming, um, the the party sequence, the train sequence, all very unsettling, uh, unsettling sequences. sequences for sure. Also, his girlfriend. Can we just talk about how much we hate her? Because I mean, she's a Jezebel. She's Jezebel, which biblical reference, yes, and mm-hmm. a good lay, but a terrible person. That's <laughs> well, what she was. So I didn't know this since I was watching the movie, but Jacob Slather, it, the whole story of Jacob Slather is a biblical reference. It is. I had to look it up and I was like, oh God, I, I do love Jesus. I promise. But I forgot what the story was. <laughs> and, and it's the it's the lather leaving to heaven that was featured in, in a dream that the biblical patriarch Jacob had during his flight from his brother Esau in the book of Genesis. Yeah. Having read that sentence, I still don't understand but that's okay i'm assuming no one here we all of us watch this for the first time and i'm sure you can find a lot of stuff written about this movie that we're not even covering it's been out for so long like i'm sure there's been there's been you know breakdowns of this but i'm assuming no one here saw the remake right no Mm -mm. no Mm -mm. because i'm just curious if it ends differently or you know what i mean yeah i didn't even know there was a remake when it was the remake 2019. Oh, very recent. Yes. Yeah. Didn't know. I think the first one is it's just fine how it is, disturbing <laughs> images and all. Because that was. Oh, yeah. This is super cool. different. After losing his brother in combat, Jacob Singer returns home from Afghanistan only to be pulled into a mind twisting state of paranoia. Singer soon realizes that his sibling is alive, but life is not what it seems. With his life now altered, he must figure out what is real and what is not. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> this has a 4% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, my God. Wow. wow. Okay, I guess we're not going to watch that. We can just uh, do the Jamie and read the plot summary on uh, (laughs) and leave it at that. Well, speaking of Rotten Tomatoes, do we want to Rotten Tomato this one? It's the Rotten Tomatoes game. Let's do it. What do you think, knowing that the remake is a 4%, 
Yikes. <laughs> what would you what do you think this Rotten Tomato score is for the 1990 Jacob's Ladder? Oh, uh, 55. Jamie? Mm, 71. It's a 73. Holy crap. I'm a genius. The audience, <laughs> the audience score is higher at 84. Um, but the mm. critics' consensus is, even with its disorienting leaps of logic and structure, Jacob's Ladder is an engrossing, nerve-shattering experience. I, I feel like that's, the, that's what we came to. It was nerve shattering. Are your nerves okay? Yeah, uh, they're not shattered. <laughs> that's that's like fl- that's like floral language. Um, but it was definitely an engrossing, like nervy experience. Mm. Yes, a nervous experience. Yeah, I was nervous. I bit my nails. <laughs> okay, I may have dozed okay. off. Well, let's put that to <laughs> the test with these ratings and see what you gave it. Should we do the four S's? S's? The four S's. Skulls, scares, shakes, and suggestions. The talking horns, four S's. Okay, so we have the four S's, which stands for skulls, scares, shakes, and suggestions. Um, We're going to rate them one through ten and then give a suggestion. Ten being like, does it great? One being like, it does not do it great. So let's start with skulls. Skulls is for the mental health and human behavior aspect of this movie, one through ten. Jamie, what you giving giving Jacob's ladder? (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to give it a a 4.5. Um, cause I think that there are some moments that it's trying to demonstrate PTSD, yeah. but then it fucking loses all of the points by carving us on that gurney over body parts. Oh my gosh. Never forget that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to give it a five for that same reason, because it was trying and I appreciate any movie that's going to shed light on PTSD, specifically with veterans. But all in all, the scaring people away from mental health is not cool. So five for me. Cool. I'm going to go with a five for the same reasons. Uh, okay. Uh, scares one through 10. Was this scary at all, Jamie? Um, I'm going to give it a 2.5, uh, for like feeling unsettled, feeling uncomfortable, feeling nervous. Mm. Um, but it wasn't like scary, scary, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Nikisha. Yeah. I wasn't shielding my eyes. Although, when the flashback happened and uh, with Macaulay Culkin and being run over by the truck. And so, you know, it's going to happen, but then it flashes back to Jacob and he's all fine. And then it flashes back to the Mm. truck running over the Mm -hmm. bike. That was a little spoofy. So I'll give it a two. A two. A two. Solid two. Yeah, I'm giving it a two as well. That was the scene. That was the one scene that actually like made me like jump a little bit because that you think it's done, you're gonna assume what happens, and then it, it cuts the other thing. Right. Um yeah. uh, again, you know, really that was that was pretty effective. Um shakes. Could you shake this movie off? Uh or are you gonna like this is a one and done? Thank you so much. Uh <laughs> Jamie. Um, I'm gonna give it a seven. I've been thinking about this for a while. And I think it stuck around in my head in order to like process it more. Um, so yeah, I'm still thinking about it. It wormed its way into my nightmares. It tentacled its way in. Yeah. Oh, the tentacles. <laughs> <laughs> Nikisha. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm gonna give it a three. I don't think I'm gonna think about it that much. <laughs> it's just a movie that we got to discuss on the podcast and that will be my memory of three for me. Um, but give it a six um, because I feel like this is a well-known movie. Like this is a perfect one we did for March Madness. Um, 
Uh, so I feel like it's going to come up in conversation and like, this is like one of those movies you can have in your belt. Um, I've definitely been thinking about it. So I give it more than a five cause it's not going to go away. Um, but it's definitely not like, you know, higher, like, you know, like a psycho or a scream or something like that. For sure. Um, cool. Um, suggestions. What suggestions do you have to pair with this ladder? Perhaps a paint can? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Well, I, I could not think of anything, Jamie. I know you have all the answers. <laughs> I I don't have all the answers. I had I had two thoughts. Um, one was session nine, which takes place in the mental health facility, hmm. and the other one I think has been recommended in the past, but I can't remember. Um, was the machinist. Mm-hmm. With Christian Bale. Yeah. Oh. Um, that's a good one. Um, I would recommend two. Um, the first one I would recommend uh, is 12 Monkeys. Um, mm. It is totally not this movie, uh, but it has unreliable storytelling, uh, t- quote, time travel, um, um, you know, uh, mental health wards, stuff like that. So... Mm. potentially that but actually my real one um is oh that was a fake that one. was a fake <laughs> one uh, my real one is an occurrence at the owl creek bridge which i brought up earlier in this yeah. episode um it's a french film that uh oh, was, oui, 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 that was aired as part of uh season five of the twilight zone so season five mm. episode 22 of the twilight zone is a short film called an occurrence at the owl creek at owl creek bridge it's based on a, a short story um uh i don't want to if you haven't seen it, i don't want to ruin it um but it pairs really well with this film did any of y'all ever watch the reboot of Twilight Zone? That yeah, Jennifer the Jordan. Reviews? I watched some episodes. Yeah. Okay, I watched some too. I was just wondering how you felt about it since you brought up Twilight Zone. Um, the original Twilight Zone is one of my favorite things of all time. Like it's I great. love it. That, I I would argue that that's actually what got me into horror. Um, that mm-hmm. and the Universal Monster movies got me into the Universal movies got me into horror. The Twilight Zone got me into like science fiction and just like wreath or science fantasy whatever you want to call it like rethinking kind of how you see the world and like i just liked all the wacky stories and the and the supernatural stuff so um yeah um the new one had its moments but it didn't have the same it's just different i i i I prefer black mirror over um the new twilight zone um if that makes sense do we know if Black Mirror is coming back anytime soon? I don't know. My God. I have no idea. The 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 the, the first Ten. season was spectacular. Mm-hmm. The other ones have been good, but not as good as their first one. But the whole concept in general, fantastic. Yes, Black Mirror is is fantastic. Okay, well, I think that wraps up our episode of climbing Jacob's ladder, which is also a uh, Christian hymn. Hmm. If you didn't oh, know, interesting. We are climbing. Jacob's ladder with my uh, sick voice. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> did, you do old... sing that while doing Jacob's ladder at the gym. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I would have the the strength and stamina of Beyonce if I did that. <laughs> my goodness. Well, you can follow us at Talk <laughs> at Talking Horror well, at Beyonce at Beyonce. We love you, Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> We stand for you. Oh, my God. That's a horror movie. That's what we need. Uh, So you can follow us on all of the social medias, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at TalkHorrorPod, P-O-D. And Brian, where can they listen to us? Yeah, we're a podcast. So wherever you find your podcast, check check us out on Stitcher, on Spotify, and, of course, Apple Podcasts. You can rate and review us there. Uh, Five stars, please. And thank you. Thank you. And I I also – I also do want to add, just in case you're following along with us, um, next week we finish out March Madness with Misery, and then we're moving on to the films of uh, Robert Eggers um, leading up to the release of The Northman. So we're going to do The Witch, we're going to do The Lighthouse, uh, and then we're going to do uh, The Northman. So uh, check us out. Uh, so if you want to catch up and, and listen uh, to those, um, that's what I would suggest watching next. 
Yes. And follow us on our TikTok as producer Brian is putting out some fabulous content. And I'm some having stuff that requires no Brian and stuff that requires your comments and things, you know, movie franchises that you would get rid of all the things. It's, it's good stuff. So check out our TikTok. Yeah, I'm having a ton of fun. Come hang out with us on TikTok. It's it's uh, it's just good horror fun. Yes. Good, good old horror, horror fun. fun. All right. Well, that has been our episode. What should we sign off with? I wish you could put ladder sounds, whatever a ladder sound is. Yeah, I'll put the ladder. Tentacle sound. Tentacle. Ooh, tentacle. <laughs> okay, I don't know where I'm going to find these things. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Thanks, yeah. guys. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>